Um, this is a question that uh, people have asked and tried to answer since the beginning of time. Uh, God says He is one, and yet Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make the Trinity, the three in one. God has no beginning and no end. Uh, John 1 says it well. It says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. Uh, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through Him. And nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everyone that was created, and His life brought light to everyone, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world that He created, but the world didn't recognize Him. He came to His own people, and even they rejected Him. But to all who believed and accepted Him, He gave the right to become children of God. They were reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or a plan, but birth that comes from God. And so the Word became human, and He made His home among us, and He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we've seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. You know, if you do a quick Google search, you'll find that God has anywhere from one to seven to over a hundred different names. And that can be a bit confusing at first glance until you realize that God himself has given himself at least two names. To Abram, God appeared and said, I am El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. Uh, serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. And later on, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And when asked who Moses should say sent him back to his people, God said, Yahweh, which means I am. So we have El Shaddai, God Almighty, and Yahweh, I am. And Jesus used a few, such as the Good Shepherd or the Son of Man. And there are many names that were found in prophecies referring to Jesus and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And while as far as we know, they aren't actually on his birth certificate, um, they were names used to help describe who God was. Uh, for really, when we ask God, who are you? A name might get us a little ways, but what we're really asking is, God, tell me about yourself. What are you like? Who are you really? And he answers and says, I'm Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us, El Elyon, God Most High, Elohim, the first name that we hear for God right there in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, Elohim, the Supreme One, created the heavens and the earth. El Roy, the God who sees me, Ancient of Days, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh our provider, Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh our healer, Jehovah Shalom, Yahweh our peace, Jehovah Tzidkenu, Yahweh our righteousness, Jehovah Shema, Yahweh is here, Yahweh Tzavaot is the God of armies, is Abba, Father, Jesus. All of these names and many, many more not only give God's give God something for us to call Him, but they also help answer the question, who is God? See, God appears to different people in different ways for different purposes, not because He's constantly changing, but because Yahweh, He is. Whatever it is you need in your life, God is. I mean, maybe you need a father who actually cares about you and loves you and delights in you and is proud of you, and He is that Adonai, Father. Maybe you need some peace in your heart and your life. He is that shalom. Maybe you need someone to rise up and fight the enemy on your behalf because you just haven't got the strength. He is Yahweh Tzavaot, the God of armies. It's tempting, probably because it makes things simpler for us to focus on and embrace only one or two of these characteristics of God as we go through our life. But what is the truth? Who is God really? Uh, this is a question that goes way farther and deeper than any one message ever could. And so we're going to break it up. And today we're going to look specifically at just one aspect of who is God. And so for this first part of our journey, let's start in the beginning. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, Elohim, the Supreme One, created heaven and the earth. See, God is creator. And as creator, God does everything well. And as a creator, God speaks goodness into his creation. Check it out. Earth, our home planet, is one of eight planets in our solar system. And yet, as far as we know, it's the only one with life. Why? Uh, Venus isn't even the closest one to the sun, but its temperature is well above 400 degrees Celsius, and its atmosphere is pure poison. So there's no life there. Mars isn't too hot, but it's cold and dry and often has dust storms that are so massive they can cover the entire planet. Uh, it has ice, 
but no liquid water. And so while parts of it are close to being life-sustaining, it still hasn't quite got it. Uh, Neptune's about 30 times farther away from the sun than the Earth is, so it's super cold. Not to mention the wind chill, uh, because Neptune has winds that blow up to 2,400 kilometers an hour. Um, for reference, the speed that sound travels is only 1,225. Uh, see, the only Earth has not only the right temperature, but the right atmosphere, the right soil, and the right water conditions needed for life. So even if we played Cosmic Fixer Upper and switched a few things around, Mars in the place of Earth might be warm enough and have water, but those planet-wide dust storms would block out and choke out the necessary light needed to grow vegetation. Venus in the place of Earth might be cool enough to live on if the atmosphere wasn't pure poison. Neptune might be warm enough too, but the winds are constantly blowing at twice the speed of sound and that wouldn't really work well for anyone. Uh, it's almost as if somebody specifically designed and created and placed this planet here for the purpose of life because somebody did. In six days, God created the earth, the sun, the moon, the waters, and the skies. He filled the earth with life, plants, animals, and people, and God told each of those things as they came into being that they were very, very good. So let's shift gears a bit now, leave the astronomy department and head on over to the botany section. I know many of you are fully involved in the gardening season and those of you who have spent those hours with your fingertips in the dirt, uh, preparing seeds, nurturing and watering them as they grow and enjoying their delicious fruits know like I do, all this green stuff around us is an absolute miracle. The fact that everything necessary for your tomato plant to grow and produce those delicious tomatoes is in one tiny little seed is absolutely astounding. And it's not even like you have to keep adding stuff as they grow, like, oh, seedlings four inches now, uh, gotta remember to tack on a few leaves. Uh, they just do it, they just grow. God said that they were good and they believed it. They followed that blueprint for life that he embedded in their DNA and off they go. And all that doesn't even begin to touch on how God created each plant specifically to thrive in its intended environment. See, God gave desert plants, for example, extremely long roots so they can dig deep for underground water. Other desert plants like cacti, they're able to internally store water from rare desert rainfalls for a long, long time. Rainforest plants, on the other hand, they have the opposite problem. Instead of storing water, they need to get rid of it, as some can get up to 100 inches of rain every year. But with that in mind, God gave many of those little plants something called drip tips, which quickly send all that extra water dripping away so the leaves don't get moldy. I mean, talk about careful and purposeful design. God created each of these things for life here on earth and he told them they were good and they believed it. So, we've looked at the astronomy department, spent a little time in the botany section, let's go to the people place. Uh, do you have any idea how amazing you are? You know, when God created you and said you were good, did you believe him? Uh, Psalm 139.14 says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your workmanship is marvelous. I know that full well. Do you want to know something amazing? Your eye is something amazing. You know, I can remember as a kid, my dad used to say something like, you know why I have no doubt that God created everything? The human eye. It's way too intricate and, and incredible just to happen on its own. I mean, check it out. While you were still in your mother's womb, God began to put everything together. And when you're about five months along, one million optic nerves endings began to, to stretch out from your brain to meet up and connect with one million optic nerve endings stretching out from your eyes. And all two million of them matched up and connected perfectly. Uh, can you imagine? Can you imagine if God had to take your kids to work day and he gave you just that one job to do? Connecting those million nerve endings from the brain with their exact matching million nerve endings from the eye? Like, good luck. But that's exactly what God designed them to do. He placed our unique blueprints for life inside our DNA. He told us we were good and off we went, following those prints to a T without even realizing it. So that was month five. Month six comes along and God does something else extraordinary. Around month six, um, an incredibly complicated chain reaction happened and slowly, and mysteriously, see, you just have this eyelid at this point, and slowly and mysteriously, uh, the skin that makes up your eyelid begins to separate, and for the first time ever, you had two separate eyelids, a top and a bottom, and if you wanted to, you could have opened your eyes. 
I mean, that's a big deal because maybe you accidentally developed eyes and all two million nerve endings manage to grope in the dark and find their perfect partner, but what happens if nobody separates your eyelids? I mean, God's incredible signature is all over you and it's no wonder that he said that you're good. In fact, as God was creating during that first week of Earth's life, imagining and planning and speaking things into existence, when he finally got to day six, he did something different. God changed gears. He stooped to the newly created earth and began to sculpt in the mud and the clay. And when he finished what he was designing, the very first man, Adam, the Bible says that God breathed the breath of life into him and immediately he was filled with life. Genesis 2.7 puts it this way. It says, Then Yahweh Elohim formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils and man became a living person. I, can you imagine what it would have been like to have been Adam? A creation suddenly filled with the breath of life, uh, awakening for the first time in the presence of God. And, and if all that weren't incredible enough, he was created in the very image of God as well. What an astounding way to start a life. And then Eve, crafted from and created to be Adam's missing piece. Uh, the book's Patriarchs and Prophets says that Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying he wasn't, she wasn't to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him, a part of man, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. She was his second self, showing the close union and the affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. Uh, for no man ever yet hates his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. In that first week, God created the earth, the skies, the seas, and everything in them. And he created humanity. And he created marriage, a kind of marriage where husband and wife are equal, partners, and where they take care of each other and love each other. Not as some think, as an unequal partnership where one partner takes advantage of the other as if it's some sort of God for God-given right. Instead of union as protection, instead he gave us union as protection and sacrificial love and submission and guys of giving up your life for her. And he told it all how good it was and we believed him. And finally when all was accomplished and every piece knew that it was good, God created one more thing. It's a Sabbath, a weekly date with God. A chance to meet with our Creator, to soak up His presence, to rest from our day-to-day -day routines, and to enjoy as family uh, the wonder and goodness of His creation. Ephesians 2.10 says it perfectly. We are God's masterpieces. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. You're no accident. You're God's masterpiece created with a purpose to do the good things that He prepared for us long ago. And so, who is God? Well, God is Creator. Yahweh Elohim. I am Supreme. He created the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, and everything in it, each aspect designed specifically with purpose and intention. He created Adam and Eve and marriage the way it was meant to be. He created Sabbath to rest and reflect and enjoy together with Him. He created you and He created me. And He told us that we were good. So believe Him when He says that. And together, let us do the good things that He planned for us so long ago.